So we're going to get started. I am here with Matt Langlois. He is our VP of Customer Success. Uh, and most of you who are CDU or other users have probably interacted with him um, on multiple occasions at this point, uh, if not all three of these guys. Um, and he, so he's responsible for making sure that uh, you are able to get the stuff done that you need to do when you're using CD router. Uh, Brad is our head of training. So if you have done any training sessions whatsoever, you have seen his face uh, many times as well. Uh, and he has a couple of tips that he's going to give us. And uh, Brian is uh, <laughs> Brian was there probably if you had any support questions whatsoever. Um, you, you've interacted with Brian before. So um, between the three of them, uh, we're going to show you some cool stuff. And we're going to get started with Brian. Oh, good. So the uh, first tip I wanted to share today, I'm sure you, as we all know, we see log files all the time. And one of the things I've noticed a lot is that the config files that I receive are from really a long time ago, right? So Jason, can you slip to the next slide for me? So I don't know if people know this, but we add some functionality and features into a config file. So we change test files sometimes, we deprecate some, we change the default values on some times. It's not every release, but it is enough time so you should probably keep your configs up to date. So it's really easy to find out if how old your config is. Uh, I have a screenshot here showing you. If you go in, at the very top of when I can do a config file, you see the version. And if you're in it, editing it, you can just hit the upgrade button and it will upgrade it for you to the current release. So changing test files to new values and stuff and stuff like that. Uh, Jason, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so there are a few things that are not automatically brought over. So it's always good to make a backup. So we do have this option here when you upgrade to do that. And I'm going to show you a trip, a little trick here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So here's a list of uh, one of my CD router systems that have a whole list of config files. You just click on one of them. And if you click here in the about section, this is the very top of your config file, you can see the version that this was where this is config file is from. So I created this back when I was running CDRider 12.12. Obviously, we're way beyond that now. I can just hit this upgrade button here and it will convert the config file to be current into the current uh, the version that is currently running on your CD router system. So some things to point out is that when you do this. If you have a certain uh, layout in your config file, it will go back to a default setting. So if you've moved all your test stars, you put values into the top, doing an upgrade will set them all back to a, a previous version uh, or the template that we use. Yeah, it reformats everything. Mm -hmm. It reformats it all, right? Uh, so I won't, put the, I won't hit the upgrade button right now, but if I go back to the config. So obviously I have a small handful. Some of you I'm sure out there have pages of config files. So it can be tedious to do them all one by one, which is the feature we have right now, but there is a trick. If you go in and say you want to select a couple of these and you do bulk edit, you can just make up a test file that has no meaning and change it in here. And then when you save, it will actually upgrade both those files that you're editing, right? So it's a, just a little trick to get more than one at a time. The only problem with this is you can't back up in this this way, right? It, there's no there's no way to back up, so that's one right. thing to keep in mind. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So and now I knew I can announce that uh, we've seen this as a deficiency, so we've added a bulk <laughs> edit feature in the next version of Studio Router, which is coming out uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, right? That's correct. So thirteen yeah. nine, you'll see another button that you can do just a bulk config upgrade of all your config files, one shot. So Brian, we have one question that just came in. If you if they do upgrade it, will it change any of their values? And no, the, the values that you have there set, if there's any that are, so when you have a commented out test file, right? That's gonna use the default value. If we have changed the default value, which uh, we've done a uh, very, very small amount of times, PD exclude is the last one I remember, where whether or not in V6, if you use the prefix or not, we change the default value. Yeah. But no, any value that you've set and uncommented will remain. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about 
In this tip, we're going to talk about enabling cloud access uh, using the ICS feature, which stands for Internet Connection Sharing. So Internet Connection Sharing, it's part of the security expansion in CD Router. Uh, what it does is allows any traffic that your device sends to go through CD Router out to the Internet. So normally what happens is when you're running tests, CD Router is in an isolated environment. It's sending and receiving all of the traffic from your device and anything that it doesn't know about that it doesn't expect, it's going to drop any DNS requests. It's going to answer if it knows how to resolve it. But if it doesn't, it's just going to respond saying, I don't know about this uh, host you're trying to look up. With ICS enabled, anything that CD router doesn't know about, it's going to forward on out the internet uh, using the management interface of the NTA 1000. So your NTA 1000 is already connected to your lab network. If it has internet access, that those packets are going to go out to whatever public address your device is trying to reach. So if you have a device that needs to access the cloud for some reason, it checks for firmware updates, uh, it actually needs to update its firmware. It, um, if it needs to check for connectivity to any remote services that are on the internet, that's a big one. Yep, the device will be able to complete those actions while still operating in the isolated environment within CD router. So only those unknown destinations are making it out through the NTA 1000 to the internet. Um, likewise, when CD router receives a DNS request from your device, it will, um, if it doesn't know how to resolve that, it's going to pass it to the NTA 1000. The NTA 1000 has its own DNS servers, so those res that resolver will translate and resolve the address for you using basically internet-based DNS servers. And it's really easy to configure, so it's within the security expansion. You just turn it on and you specify the management interface. Normally, that's ETH0 for everybody, and that's all there is to it. And then once uh, once you've done that, CD router captures all of that traffic. So any traffic that it's passed out through the uh, management interface, the DNS requests and the, those packets get saved in their own capture file. And so that's available and you can look at that those packets specifically. Um, those, once you open that, are shown in a in the cloud chart view within CD router, or you can configure CD router to upload them to an, an external cloud shark appliance. Yeah, that's usually pretty handy. You get this. It's always always fascinating to see what devices are trying to do. Like, right, who exactly. they're talking to, what other requests they may be trying to do to upgrade firmware, right. or all of the stacks, all that. Sort of thing. Exactly, all kinds of background information going on outside of the testing. All right, so tip number three, this is one of my personal favorite features of CD Router. I use it all the time. And uh, a lot of us here internally at QA Cafe also use it quite a bit. Um, there's a feature within CD Router called the, the Device Manager. And uh, what that really allows you to do is store meta information about the DUTs that you have connected to the system on the system itself. So you can uh, add information uh, such as the, the current firmware version that's running, uh, default username and password, Wi-Fi uh, username and password. Uh, you can even upload uh, device config files and device firmware files. Uh, that's all done under the devices page within CD Router's web UI. But one of the really, really neat things that you get with this feature is that there is a, a device connect capability. And essentially what that does is when you set that up uh, and enable it, CD Router will create a, a web proxy to the device's management interface. And what's really neat about that is that from wherever you happen to be, if you have access to CD Router's web GUI, you can now also remotely access the GUI of the DUT itself. So you don't have to walk into the lab, for example, with a laptop and, and connect it to the DUT. You can do all of that just from your chair and your cube straight through CD Router. Uh, so it's very handy and saves a lot of time. Uh, it's easy to set up. Uh, step one really is that you have to go to the devices tab within CD router, uh, hit new to create a new device for the DUT that you are uh, using. Fill out all of the information. And once you do that, um, there's a, a few additional parameters in the management section, which is where you have to tell CD router uh, what IP you want 
um, CD router to use when connecting remotely to the device's management UI and also which interface. Um, once you do that, you can also then uh, hit the, or I should say, you can now hit the connect button and that's what establishes that proxy between CD router and the device's management interface. Once you've connected, there's another little link right here that you can click on. And once you do that, boom, you'll uh, have a new tab open up with a direct connection into the device's management interface. It should wait a few seconds. Yeah. I found that you know, the, the proxy needs to be set up. So once you say connect, wait a few seconds, mm -hmm. then go to the management interface. Correct. And the device also has to be on. Um, really cool thing that, uh, on the other slide where you have, we do this, uh, we do this here is that we have firmware versions for each of the, the devices that we have. So if we ever do something bad to the device, we can come right here and grab the firmware, put it back. We don't, we know where it is, right? We don't have to go find it on the net or whatever. Correct. Same with config files as well. Sometimes uh, we'll be testing a device and it will get into a bad state or we'll have to just factory reset it. So we save all of our running configs from our lab within the device manager tab on all of our test systems. So that it's really easy to recover uh, if you do have to reset. The username and password is pretty nice too. Because I it is, remember yeah. how the You don't have to look at the sticker on the Physical. bottom or anything like that. Right? Exactly, anything that's physically on the sticker, you don't have, you can just store right in CD router and just make it all in one place. Yeah, so you did have a feature on the other slide, right? About that little orange thing. That's That's been super handy too. Oh, right, I forgot to mention that, yeah. Previously, up until just a few releases ago, the device connect feature was automatically disabled if any tests were running on the system. So um, that was a limitation that's now been removed. So now it actually is possible if tests are running on the system, you can also access the management interface of different devices that you have connected to it, which is really powerful. Not the same device, just any others any other that aren't currently under test. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. That, that was a question that just came in is... Uh... If you can access the the Dutz UI while a test is actively running, so not on that device. Yeah, you not on the device that's under test, but any of the other devices you have connected. Right, right. So you could work around that maybe by having a secondary interface. Yes, and that would work. And that does work, and I have done that. So it is possible, but you have to set up a second, uh, man dedicated management right. interface to the device. All right, here, this is, the, uh, this is the same device that I just had in that screenshot. I've already kind of staged it here, so it's on. The device is on, and uh, I've already connected to it. So I can now go to View Management Interface. Here I am. I can log in. And whoops. So this is, uh, this, is, this is the Dutz Web UI. I'm accessing it. Um, from the conference room here, right from the CD router interface. So you can do everything you want right from here, which is nice. You don't have to, like I said, you don't have to physically get up and move. You can do it all right from your chair, which is really convenient. All righty. Cool. I won't lie. I had a small heart attack when you said you were going to do that. <laughs> do it live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to grab control for Brian here so that I can do the slides and he can do his demos. Here we go, Brian. Oh, yes. Backing up your data. So this has been kind of a hot topic lately. Um, so Cedar Router sometimes or occasionally will upgrade the, um, the sort of underlying image that runs on the hardware. So the operating system or Linux. And usually before we do that, we kind of want to have the data, your CD router data backed up before we do that, because it, you know, it could be destructive. Um, it's, it's not intended to be, but it's always good practice in there to back up your CD router data. So uh, show me the next one, please. Yeah, okay. So uh, all of your CD router data is located in one location. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's user CD router dash data. And I have a listing there. So your log files, your results, your packet captures, the config files, the, the package definitions are all located in this directory. So if you want to back up your CD router data, this is the directory you need to back up. 
Uh, we also have, we also suggest that if you do, and if you add any of your own stuff, if you have your own scripts that you have on Zerider, for example, or your own tests, you put it into that custom subdirectory under this so that again, all of your data is in one spot to make it easier to back up. Your CD router uh, for the past at least seven years, all CD router systems have two hard drives inside. One is where the operating system lives. And that's the thing that we may update from time to time or ask you to update. The other one is the data drive. So it's completely separate. So we don't have to touch that drive in that process of upgrading. But always, I would always caution you to back up your data first. Um, you can do it however you see fit. Uh, you can tar it up, copy it off somewhere. However, we do have a utility you can use. And that's what the other side of this slide shows. It's the CDRider backup tool. This tool's only purpose is to back up everything in this directory, user CDRider dash data. It allows you to, it tars it, uses rsync and SSH if you want to, to another system on your network so that your, all your data can be saved off somewhere in a tar file. It so happens to be, there's a CDRider restore tool as well to when you wanna restore it, you can use that. So if you don't have a preferred method to back up your stuff, use our tool. Where, where do you get the tool? It's in the knowledge base, right? Mm -hmm. There is a knowledge base article. It's oh, actually, yeah, the link is right it, there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's installed with CDRouter. So okay. you can see up on top there, user CDRouter bin, CDRouter dash backup, and I have the command, what, what it looks like. Now you can, there's a bunch of other options you can add to it, but uh, basically used to back up that CDRouter data and move it somewhere else. So that you at least have a copy of it somewhere. I would, you know, Whatever your whatever your customary backup routine is, it would be good to do this. Yeah, it's always good practice to backup your data periodically, yeah. however often you you decide to do that once a month, every couple of weeks. Right. Um, but let us know uh, if you have any questions about it. Yeah, read the Kirby KB article. If it's still not clear, let me know. <laughs> yeah. So the next tip is about automating your testing um with the api so any any of you who've been training with me you know that the gui that you normally use in your browser that is built on top of cd router's web api so everything that you do within the gui you can also do you can also automate so this allows you to do so many different things without having to be in front of the browser manually doing your testing uh, so normally when you think of automating, you think of just launching your tests and retrieving results, you know, taking results and putting them into your reporting system. But you can do all kinds of other things. You can monitor the progress interactively. You can have a, a sophisticated script that checks for tests as they're finished. So as each test case, each individual test finishes, you can grab the result before while the test is uh, while the test package is still running other tests. Uh, that allows you to, you know, just act more quickly, um, grab any failures. You can also search into the log file. So not just that a test failed, but you can grab all of the, any relevant messages from the log about why that test failed and put those into whatever reporting that you are generating uh, with your script. So a lot of people who are running tests, they're also working with a bug tracking tool or some kind of, you know, external reporting system you can gather up as much information you want and pass that into that system. Uh, often it's good also to just have the URL to CD router so that people can go and investigate. But from a reporting and an automation standpoint, it's great to be able to do those things. You can also rerun your tests. So normally from the browser, there's a re restart button and there's options there for running a subset of tests but it's a little bit limited compared to what you can do with the API. You can select a specific list of tests that you want to rerun um, and you can specify lots of different options. And it makes it just very easy to do that because once you've automated that and have a script that knows what to do, you're not typing everything. You're not, you know, it's just a, a one-click operation in general. Just add some string. I haven't found it that way. It's actually more stuff you can do with the API than you can in the URI in some cases. Right. Yeah. You can just do much more complicated yeah. things, uh, sophisticated, I, right. I guess. Is, um, 
than what the web API, sorry, than what the GUI itself can do. Right. The last thing I've noted there was creating and editing configs. You could do that on the fly as well. You could have mm -hmm. a script that modifies your configuration before running your tests. And so if you wanted to run the same test package in a variety of different configurations, normally what you would probably do is create a separate configuration for each one of those. But with automation, you can just modify the script same each one. time. Yeah. Uh, and and do and use that you can also interact with that devices tab so you can hit that normally in the devices tab what matt just showed there's a button to turn on and turn off your device you can do that from your automated right. script right. through the devices tab uh, so that button actually is present in the api so there's just lots of things that you can do uh, for more information so the api itself is documented on our site uh, under the user guides section and we also have a Python wrapper module around the web API. So I do this all the time. If I'm doing any kind of API work, writing small scripts, I wrote a script that purges or prunes off old results. So we have a system. I pulled in every result from our lab over like the past year and a half. <laughs> and it fills up the four terabyte drive pretty quickly. Like uh, after, I think I've got eight months worth and before we max out. And so I've got a script that automatically goes and, and deletes results until I'm at like 95%. Right. And then it stops. And Apparently it does that. And that's working in that. More drives <laughs> and Brad's system. <laughs> so, but that Python wrapper module is, is key. It, it works great. Um, it just has a lot of convenience um, methods in there as well. Things that take two or three steps through the regular web API uh, are really easy with is one call. Is that one of our example ones? We have, um, a, we have a small set of example ones, right? Right. Yeah, there might be. Yeah, I think those we have a set of example scripts that are on the site as well. They're linked from the web API documentation. And some of those examples will have, a, you know, they use those convenience uh, methods. Yeah. Looking things up by name is a common example. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about ways to use the API, send them our way. Brad is, is an expert in the API, does a lot of things with Python and writes all kinds of interesting scripts. Many of those we've published in our example scripts directory, mm -hmm. but if people have other ideas. Other one, the pruning one. You should. I should. I'll, I'll, I'll make, make it down. down. <laughs> make a note. <laughs> okay, so this next tip is uh, really about stability testing. And, and the tip is, to make time, take time to do stability testing. Um, it's really, really important. And whenever we do it here in our lab, we always find really interesting things. So I wanna start just by highlighting what stability testing is. Um, it's really the, uh, it, it's, it's the mixing of functional and performance tests together and running those tests for longer periods of time. I usually try to run a stability test for maybe 24 hours to 48 hours. So often I'll do it and set it up, uh, run it over the weekend because it's just convenient to do that. Um, the really interesting thing about stability testing is that it often finds issues that you, you might not find otherwise. If you just run performance tests or if you just run functional tests, things may look perfect. But when you mix the two together, there are all kinds of interactions that end up happening, protocol interactions, device, uh, interactions with clients on the land that over time result in degraded performance. And the only way that you'll see that is if you actually do this type of longer duration stability testing. Um, just to give you an example, uh, this is a device in the lab here. At, uh, I ran a long duration performance test. So this is just performance test. There's no functional test in here. This ran for uh, about 12 hours. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, the performance was pretty stable over that period of time. Um, if you just did this, if you just did the performance testing, you might say, looks great, everything is good. Good point, like each of those, there's a bunch of dots there. Correct. Each one of those is an individual test. It's an individual test. And we graph a point data value that comes out of that test. So if you're looking at the test log, these are, these are all just be passes. Correct. But we have this screen here, the performance screen that pulls that aggregate data out and puts it here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is just performance tests. Now look what happens if I take the exact same dot, the exact same CD router config, 
and I just add a couple of additional functional tests to the package, look what happens. So it starts out just fine, but then after about two hours, the performance all of a sudden tanks. And it basically drops all the way down from you know, 400, 500 megabits per second down to about 20 megabits per second. And the only thing that I did different was I added a few functional tests into that same package. You know, which one, like what type of? So I have um, I have a little recipe. Oh, thanks, Jason, for putting my uh, <laughs> my emoji there. That's a little chef hat. Uh, this I thought, uh, I thought the mustache was a good. Yeah, the good. mustache is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is my normal recipe that I use for stability testing when I'm uh, verifying a new device here in the lab. I always start with the top 100 test list. This is a link. So when you get the presentation afterwards, you can click on this and grab that. But I start with top 100. I add the Wi-Fi test module. And then I usually add just one scaling test, scale one, and then uh, the perf one through test. perf four test cases. And that's it. That's the package. Mm -hmm. uh, one iteration through this, this set of tests is pretty quick. It takes maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can loop this many times over the course of the weekend, for example and have um, a real nice mix of functional performance tests. And then you can plot the performance over time like I did in the previous slide and see what happens. Did you, now that you said the perf test, are they sprinkled in amongst 100? Or did you put them at the end? Or I just put it, them at the end. Okay. That's it. And I can share this. But this you can test mix list. it in too. And that might do something different certainly. as well. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. You, you, could, you could run more perf tests if you wanted to. But this is a great starting point right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And this is what I use all the time. So my typical config would be to loop this uh, test list here 50 times with about 10 clients. I usually use Wi-Fi clients as well when I'm running this. Um, I think it's just a little more realistic and uh, they're, they're a little less stable than an Ethernet client might be. Um, this is all IPv4, my standard sort of recipe, but you could certainly add in IPv6 tests as well. Add a little and spice. Add a little spice, a little IPv6 and see if that, um, that changes things. That's right, Tre tweaking log files. All right, so again, we are, we, what we see, hundreds of log files, maybe even, maybe in the air, maybe even a thousand, I don't know. It, it's a lot. We look at them all day long. <laughs> uh, so what we really hope is that you guys, the customers, can do some of these same things that we do. We look at these, I mean, granted, we look at these every day of our lives. We know how to look through them kind of efficiently and quickly, but maybe there's some tools in here that you didn't realize that were there. So I wanted to point them out to you. <clears throat> Log files can be huge, right? They can, they have messages from the test itself. They have messages from each individual client, maybe from the WAN side uh, and packets, right? It's all sprinkled in a log file. So logs can get pretty big. It's easy if you can filter out or sort out some of the things that you don't want to see. So I'm going to point out two of them today. Uh, in the upper right corner of the log file, you can filter the type of logs that you look at and you can put keyword searches. So that's two of the ones I wanted to show you. Uh, go to the next one. So I'm going to grab this, uh, the control for a second here to show you, but I want to have it in the slide as well. Um, so the first one shows an example of looking for DHCP specifically, DHCP discover messages. So instead of seeing thousands of log lines, there's only five or six that you have to look at. And then the other one, there are, like I said, there's all different types of logs. So I have filter on log only, and that shows you, you know, the pass fail criteria of a test. So let me it's kind of a condensed view. It's a good starting right. point. I use that log only filter all the time, actually. I, I usually start with one of these because it's just they're they're big. Yeah, everything else is kind of like debug info. So the log only view is really just the high level of yeah, the stuff that makes, shows the progress of the test. So here's one, uh, the firewall test is one of those tests that's usually pretty massively huge, right? So here I've already filtered it on just log only. And I will have ICS running here as well. So that shows <laughs> you some alerts. So this, yeah. this device is doing some, sending unencrypted traffic. So that's one of the security features. We can all oh, that's right. We can analyze yeah. uh, information that that the that sends out beyond us. Right? I was going to mention that. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> that, that security expansion. It just it um monitors that I see all those packets. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think that's probably something good to mention. Um, 
the reason why the ICS is part of the security expansion uh, is because of that functionality, right? So we're running right. against. Yeah. Uh, so I just I undid the log line for a second, and I just undid this. It's, it's massive because this is a the test here is a firewall test. So we're testing the Dutch WAN side, making sure that mm -hmm. none of the ports are open. So we have 65k ports, sixty-five thousand ports. So yeah. maybe sixty-five thousand log log lines. But you just probably only want to see, hey, did that what happened? Where, where were the failures, <laughs> or where were those were there passes? So in this case, you can say they all passed. None of the none of the ports were open. So that's good. They were all installed. So that's one. Uh, this fires in the way. I'm gonna get that out of the way. All right. The other one is the keyword search, right? So I've already again filtered this one. I put. I want to look for things that have the word WLAN one in it because I want to target. This is the start file. You know, this is one that the, the test that initiates everything before uh, we actually run the test. I want to just see information about when this device, uh, this client, has come up. So if I do a search on WLAN one, I'll give me all the log lines. And if I, if you control click, you can, and I want to see right where it associates. I want to see what's happening around that time. So if you control click, the whole log comes back, the filter goes away, but it brings you right to that line. That's, That's an right awesome here, feature, right? I use that all the time. So again, if there's thousands of lines in here and you want, you're only interested in, okay, where DHCP happened, where DNS happened, search for it, then do control click and it'll bring you right to the line. You can also okay. annotate that too and right. leave yourself a little note, which is really handy. There's a little button there. Ah, look yes. at this. <laughs> right, so if you want to share this with someone, again, on the URLs, remember that all the, everything is a URL. So you pop in the URL, put the annotation in, send it to your co colleague, and you can, or if you're a tester, send it to a developer, you want them to look at something. You can tell them exactly where by annotating. And then the other little tip. And those, those annotations are, are in Markdown, right? So if you want to link to another set of results in your annotation, you can do that? Yeah, they're all marked down. That's correct. Oh, yeah, so it's more than just text. Right. And then the other thing is that all these times, the, the, each long line is a timestamp. But if you click on it, it turns into a relative time. So oftentimes, one of the things I'll do, there's timeouts that occur, right? So if, it's five seconds before uh, for a client to respond to a D speed. I want to make sure was there actually five seconds, or is it, did it happen after four? Did it happen after three? Switching this to relative time is a really easy way of finding out how much time is between, yep. let's say, this log line and some log line below. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. little tip here is that you can embed a uh, line number in the URL to to yeah. jump straight to a specific line. All right. That was, I just wanted to show you yeah. some ways of filtering to like a large log, right? So and some of the things you can do in a log file, because again, we look at these all the time. We know how to navigate through them, but we kind of would like our customers to be able to more easily navigate through them as well. So maybe, maybe they didn't know that we could do those things. <laughs> right. Right. Brad's up. All right. Uh, no, I'm not going to. No, don't do it. <laughs> I want that to work. So we'll come back. we will come back. We can always do that. So my next tip is we get this question all of the time is, can we run our own scripts while we're running CD writer tests? Like how do we introduce our own script? There's lots of reasons that people want to do this. Uh, having your own script to pull the device that you're testing for statistics or just get information from it. Uh, if you've got a test that's causing problems with your device, it's useful to be able to access the device. We just had a question earlier about how can we use that device view to get into the device. And so being able to run a script like to do some debugging while CD Router is running its, its tests is really useful. The problem is that CD Router's tests are static and so it's not designed like interactively it's an automated testing system so it's doing its thing but in between tests you can do lots you can introduce your own scripts to do any of these activities by adding uh, a command to your config file and that will allow you to run either an external command or a script that you've written in between any of the test cases and the options for this you can run them uh, before or after any 
like all of the test cases, you can have the same script run at every time. And so maybe that pulls for statistics and does the same thing after every test so that you can isolate what happens during your tests um, in your device's state, or for example. Uh, you can also designate specific test cases and run your script before or after that one specific test. And it doesn't have to be one test. You can do it, choose like a selection of tests and have different scripts run for each one of them. And then if you're writing your own custom tests that you introduce, so you can make copies of the C writers tests and modify them, you can, anything that you are customizing, you can also write, run your script right in the middle of those as well. And so there's lots of flexibility with that. And it's all done with the script exec command. So CD writers tests, they're written in Tickle, the TCL language. And that needs to, a CD writer is using that uh, when it's running its script. So if you were just to execute something directly, that would hang up CD writers processing. So the script exec is specially written to allow an external process to run while without suspending CD router. Uh, it also, you have access to all the test bar values. So if your script relies on some setting in your config file, you can incorporate that and pass whatever arguments you need to, to your script. And then all of the output generated by the script is passed back. So in the case of a custom test case, you can have that information and include that into uh, the script itself. And so if you're interested in this, it's all documented here in our knowledge base. So you can look up that article. There's a link right there and that will uh, tell you how to do that. So this is something we get we get asked about all the time, right? It's, it's actually yeah. not that hard. I got a script, can I run my script somewhere? Yeah, yeah. it right. does go in your config file. One thing you need to note is that whatever you put in the config file that's not a test bar, it's gonna get wiped out uh, if you ever upgrade um, your config file. I've written that one down to try and yep. solve that. In so, too. Right. Yeah, so for now, it's always good to make a backup of a config if you happen to have any of these script exec um, snippets embedded in there. Right, yep. So just bear that in mind. Uh, very powerful feature. You can do a lot of neat things with this. Uh, all right. All right, Matt. Let me grab the screen. By the way, I did. It worked fine. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I, <laughs> not, as soon as I, I stopped presenting, it worked. See? Yeah. All right. So tip number nine and the last one is uh, we have a few really nice features built into CD Router to help you identify, we call them diffs, between config files and test results. Uh, I use these all the time. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how to use what we call the config diff tool. So if you're on the configurations page within CD Router's web UI and you have maybe a couple of configs, you're not sure exactly, th th they're, they're different, but you're not sure exactly why they're different. Right. You can select both of those and then hit this diff button. And when you do that, you'll be presented with a view. You have both configs side by side. And this is actually a, a pretty powerful feature because you can edit configs directly from this view as well. You can also, so there's a little arrow. Yeah, it's hard to see, but that little thing right there. So the if you want the change that's in the right-hand side to be in the left-hand side, you just click on that arrow and it moves it over for you. Right. So this is really neat. I use this a lot, uh, especially when comparing configs or even when I've I'm looking at a config that may have come in from a customer, for example, and I want to see what they've changed or how it's different than a default in config, the right. because you can just select one config and hit the diff button and it compares it against a default config. Right. Makes it really easy to see exactly what has been changed. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can you can modify the, the config in the A slot here and save those changes, which is really nice as well. No, if they do an upgrade config and they do a backup, they can compare those two to there see what change. Right? Yeah, that's, that's another great use case. Right? Yep. Uh, there's also navigation buttons here, so you can jump between diffs if you want. Um, pretty powerful. We also have similar functionality for results. So from the results page within the web UI, you can select up to five different results and then hit the diff results button. Uh, and when you do that, you are presented with a new report view, and it basically uh, 
uh, displays all of those results as columns and it shows you um, which test cases passed, which ones failed and which ones weren't run in each of the results that you selected. Uh, there's also some really handy filtering options over here. So if you only wanna see the differences, you can make that uh, make those pop out really quick. Now, this is really especially powerful when your, your results are about the same test package. Exactly. Right? So you're doing like a regression. Right, every single night, or let's say once an hour, you run the exact same package and it might have 350 test cases in it. Over time, you're going to build up a, a really long data set with that same package and those same results. Now, you would typically expect the results to be consistent over time, but if you get a little blip, there's a couple of test cases that fail yesterday or last night. You can use the, the results diff tool to really quickly identify exactly which test cases were the ones that failed. The other nice thing is you can also click on the little pass fail indicators in this view and it will jump you straight to the log of that of test. Of that test. Uh, so pretty handy, uh, really interesting tool. And again, you can do all of this from the API as well if you wanna automate this. Cool. And I think that's it. So Jason, back to you at this point. Did you do the config diff from the results? Oh, uh, actually, wait one second, Jason. Yeah, it is possible. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, huge. Yeah, good point. Uh, from the results page, you can actually also select uh, a couple of results, and you can diff the configs directly from here as well. I didn't circle it, but there, mm -hmm. there's the button right there, Yeah, which oh, is really, really handy. Wow. So if you make a change to your config and it changes the way your results run, you get the snapshot in the results. You can always go back and look at it, but being able to compare them side by side to see what you changed is, is could really be the reason cute. of the failure that you now have right. that you didn't before. But yeah, or it's like we had this working perfectly, and now it now it won't anymore. So what did we change? Yeah, good good point, Brad. All right. So I just want to co cover a couple of other new features that we uh, have either introduced this year or very recently um, before we get into questions. Um, the first of that is that uh, we do have the uh, NTA 1000 V7M, which has uh, support for 802.11 AX virtualization. So you can now uh, simulate multiple AX clients in addition to all the other uh, wireless virtualization capabilities that you have, if you have the uh, virtualization uh, add-on uh, expansion uh, added to your system. Uh, so that was very, that was back in uh, September we did that. Um, you may have heard, uh, we do now have the ability to run testing in parallel on a single NTA 1000 uh, in a single CD router system, which is very powerful. Um, if you, uh, it, it does have kind of a special licensing feature that we're using for this, uh, but it's very, very powerful. Um, and it's ideal for uh, anyone who's doing that sort of high volume testing and working with a CI/CD system, um, the, the way it works is is very cool, and it's we're really re glad to be able to offer this now. Um, some good news uh, for 2023. So uh, look for more news about this coming soon. Uh, we are working with a test equipment vendor to provide a simplified uh, uh, wireless connectivity support, to five, you know, a 5G LTE connectivity support for your lab. So if you're building a fixed uh, wireless gateway uh, or one that has, uh, you know, mobile uh, backup, um, then uh, you'll be able to run that testing uh, using CD router, just like you would any other test setup, right? So CD router is going to wrap around that um, and, and work pretty seamlessly. Um, but we wanted to work with somebody that we knew was delivering a, um, a solution that would work well as CD router. Um, so uh, we'll have some more news about that in, in, in the coming year. And lastly, just a smattering of resources uh, that you can use later. Uh, we're going to be sending out these slides and the video, obviously, um, so don't worry about that. Um, Brad has been putting together a great uh, set of uh, basics training videos, so you can get yourself uh, kind of up to speed on CD Router very easily by watching those videos. You can find those there. Um, we recently did publish our uh, definitive test and guide on, on developing a test strategy, an overall test strategy for your organization and how you're uh, developing your products and pushing them out the door and what kind of testing to do when and how and when to use automation. 
Um, some of the articles that uh, have been linked to in this presentation can all be found in our knowledge base. And the one in particular that we wanted to feature um, was one that we wrote around specifically integrating CD router using the API uh, if you happen to be a GitLab user. And that's a great example of how to do it with any CI CD, CD system, but it's, it's, uh, it's GitLab specific. So if you happen to be using GitLab, that's a great uh, article to look at. Lastly, um, if you are testing end devices and haven't checked out our new uh, test solution called Passport that is designed for um, you know, smart home devices and set-top boxes and it, anything, that, uh, anything that's sitting behind a gateway <laughs> that you might be producing or, uh, or delivering uh, as an operator, then the Passport is built to test those things. And you can expect the same sort of uh, rigor and, uh, and behavior that you see in CD Router, even though it is, it's very brand new and it's built to operate a little bit differently, but uh, I think you all will like it.